Hi, Molly Horn, B464 with the brilliant Kim Ellis, scientist, mom, and wonderful wife to a great guy named Scott. Am I right? Oh, yes. And uh, he's just so proud of you, isn't he? He's been so fantastic in it, and I must say, I'm not sure how many husbands would have been as good about me being away for as long as I've been away. You've been gone three months, haven't you? Just about. Just and, about. Uh, and last time I was away, when I studied in France, I was away for 10 weeks. And uh, he took on that responsibility of running a family. So mm -hmm. we have two beautiful boys. And uh, right, right. so he's been back at home, working and looking after the boys and doing all of that. And, and he's been so supportive in, in wanting me to go forward and, and to achieve my own stuff you know it's a real partnership and I, I feel really happy when you first got into uh, space and technology as far as the space program is concerned um, you joined the organization is that how you got the scholarship to France is that how it started no I it, it's really interesting because I had been looking at the space studies program um, for a couple of years before I, like while I was still working I found out about it and um, because I'd seen nearly every launch, I've watched everything that's been going on and read avidly, and, but I kept right. it kind of in the closet. I didn't show anyone what a space nerd I was. Why? Really? Why? Well, because, you know, I think it's when you really, something really inspires you and you imagine um, mm -hmm. that you could work in something like that. And I, and I loved my job in science and technology. I just never believed um, that... You know, and I love this as much too. I love them both. And I think doing what I'm doing, I think I've found a way to actually put them together, which is like, wow, that, that, that's just and, fantastic. And that's, and that's important, I think, because, you know, you have to love what you do anymore. That's right. Right? Because when you're trying to divide your time, you know, with kids that's and, right. and, and meals and all the other things you have to do besides working. Yeah, just life. Yeah, yeah. life <laughs> itself. It, it's tough. So... When, so when was the first time you were in 2008 that you went to yeah. France? Well, no, 2008 was when I finished up in my job. I finished up just before Christmas. Okay. And I had taken the decision to take six months off to just mm -hmm. chillax, just relax. Chill out. And, <laughs> and um, before I started studying law, so I took the six months off. And during that time, I kept looking at this space studies program, and they actually were holding the 2009 space studies program. It's always in the summer, the, the Northern Hemisphere summer. Mm -hmm. So it was running June through August at uh, the NASA Ames Center. And I had been eyeing off this program, going, oh, I can't afford it because it's quite expensive. And it's around um, 20000 isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's an amazing... It's a, an amazing program though it's it's you know maybe I can get funded <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great <laughs> well they love the media whole, yeah the whole idea of the International Space University is it's a intercultural interdiscipline interdisciplinary international program and it's meant to teach you how to interact with different cultures and and how to encourage um, international cooperation and so we have roughly I mean in the year that I did the program there were 29 countries right and this year I think there's 30 countries and we have 134 participants this year it's almost the biggest one ever and um, and it's incredible because the reason I was looking at the program is because I wanted to know more about space which it does in its 60 lectures about everything to do with space and then you choose one of seven departments according to your interests. So there's space engineering, there's life sciences, there's satellite operations. And so I went into policy and law. Which which makes sense because well, it's you're great. studying law, right? Well, and my university, the University of New England, actually <laughs> gave me some private sponsorship in addition oh, wow. to my scholarship that I received from ISU. So um, I did the policy and law, and that really opened my eyes to things. Um, for like, instance? Well, for instance, space debris, you know, all of the satellites and all the bits and pieces that are that are circling the Earth. There's for a, all the years, that, and even Sputnik, you told me this I'm morning. I'm not sure I've got to check about that. I don't know if that 
that's still up there, but I, right. have, a, I have a friend who's a space archaeologist. A space archaeologist? Yeah, and she, she, she <laughs> Yeah, I know. She uh, works uh, for a university in South Australia, and, and it's amazing the stuff that she talks about, about our history in right. space. Right. And uh, so this debris, there's been um, anti-satellite tests done by different countries which have um, destroyed satellites. It was their own satellite, uh, the anti-satellite test, but it created a, field, a bigger field of debris. So it's actually circling something? I mean, it's the way you're talking about yeah. it. It's circling the earth? Is yeah. that what it's doing? In orbit there is debris. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of bits of debris in addition to all of the working satellites. And, and, there's, no, the and there's no legislation to make... There's no policy that makes it compulsory for a company when they're finished with a satellite or a piece of material to right. deorbit it. So, and how do you deorbit something? Turn off the switch? No, you've got to you've got to use fuel. <laughs> fuel. This is this is the this is the reason why no one does it. You have to use fuel, which could be used for operations. And so normally they run out of fuel, and then they stay in orbit, and that's how it is. But so it, when are they going to fall down into Earth? Well, some of them are so small they won't. They'll just keep going. They'll just keep going and going and going. <laughs> just like the little experiment that we talked about last night with, it looked like it was a balloon or it was oh, yeah. a lantern that had, it caught on fire. And I swear it was really a UFO and not <laughs> a lantern that he oh, yeah. Or weather balloon or something. Oh, who knows what it was. Right, we don't know what it was. But, you know, those are the kind of things that, you know, I'm interested in because yeah. those are ecological situations. Absolutely. And the International Space Station does maneuvers to avoid debris from time to time because it, there are multiple tracking stations around the world for the space debris and in fact this year in the space studies program um, one of the parts of the program is that there are research projects and generally there's three this year we have four and one of the projects is focusing on space debris mitigation so we have uh, 30 or so people mm -hmm. working on a research project to try and come up with a way of mitigating the debris so maybe they make a design machine that will go up and just scoop it up like a mint. Oh, like it, like a, like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, something like that. You know, but but I'm not sure what they're working on. But that'll be presented at the end of the program, and people can download all of the research that the students at the Space University do. Give that website out. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's uh, www.isunet.edu and. People can go up there and there's all kinds of research. And on that note, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back on Born Before 64 with Kim Ellis.